This is the practice exam A for unit three, exponential and logarithmic functions. So question one, part A and part B, graphing an exponential function. This is from section 4.1. So in part A, it's asking us to state the domain range, plot several points, give an equation of the horizontal asymptote. So I'm gonna start with the horizontal asymptote. Remember, typically, the horizontal asymptote of an exponential function's graph is along the x-axis at y equals 0, unless there's been a vertical shift. In this case, the graph has a vertical shift down one unit. That's where our horizontal asymptote is going to be, at negative 1. And then I'm just going to plot several points. One of those points is going to be the y-intercept. That's when x is equal to 0. Plug in a 0 for x right here. 3 to the 0 power is 1. 1 subtract 1 is 0. So 0 comma 0 is our y-intercept. And then plotting a few other points, I'm going to let x equal 1, x equal 2. When x is equal to 1, 3 to the first power is 3. 3 subtract 1 is 2. When x is equal to 2, 3 to the second power is 9. 9 subtract 1 is 8. So there's the graph. Three points are required. The, one of them is the y-intercept and then just two other points. Now this is an example of exponential growth because the base of this exponential term here is bigger than one. The domain of any exponential function, whether it's growth or decay, is always all real numbers or negative infinity to positive infinity. The range has to do with where the horizontal asymptote is. So in this case, the horizontal asymptote being at negative 1, there are no y values lower than negative 1. This graph approaches negative 1 on the y-axis, but never actually um, is equal to negative 1. So negative 1 is going to have a parenthesis around it, and the range is from negative 1 to infinity. Okay, part B. This vertical translation is up one unit, so the horizontal asymptote for this graph is a positive one. And then plotting several points, if we have a x value of 0, 0 subtract 2 is negative 2. 1 half to the power of negative 2 is the same as 2 to the power of positive 2, or 4. So 1 half to the power of negative 2 is equal to 4, and 4 plus 1 is equal to 5. So 0 comma 5 is our y-intercept. If x is equal to 1, 1 subtract 2 is negative 1. 1 half to the negative 1 is 2, 2 plus 1 is 3. If uh, x is equal to 2, 2 subtract 2 is 0. 1 half to the 0 power is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. So this graph is a representation of exponential decay because the base here of the exponential term is between 0 and 1. Domain. is still negative infinity to positive infinity. This time the range, right here, with, because the horizontal asymptote is at positive 1, the range is going to be from 1 to infinity. OK. Question 2, we're going to simplify or evaluate, find the value of these using properties of logarithms that we discussed in section 4.1 also. So part A, natural log cancels base E. So the answer is equal to 3. For part B, we need to do something with this negative 2 
that's in front of the logarithm because the seven and the log base seven can't cancel yet because that negative two. So if you remember one of the properties of logarithms, the power property, which we actually talked about in a later section, um, we can move that negative two up as an exponent. So we can rewrite this as seven and then the exponent is log base seven of three to the negative two. Now the seven and the log base seven cancel. So three to the negative two is equal to one over three squared, which is one ninth. For part C, one of the things I mentioned in class is that logarithms and radicals uh, don't fit well together in the same expression. So first thing that should always happen is you change the radical to an exponent. So log base two of eight to the power of one half. Now, when you're evaluating logarithms, what needs to happen is trying to get matching bases. Eight is a power of two. Eight is two to the third power. So instead of eight to the one half, it's two to the third power, to the power of one half. Now, one of the properties of exponents that was taught in a previous math course involved when you have a power that's raised to another power. In this case, when you have a power to a power, you multiply the powers together. So this is log base two of two. Now three times one half is three halves. Now we're to the point where the log base two cancels the base two. Three halves is no longer an exponent. It's just a numerical value of three halves. graph and logarithmic function was also in section 4.1. The difference between a logarithmic graph, the function's graph, and an exponential is that a logarithm function has a restricted domain. So if you recall from previous types of functions we've talked about with domain restrictions, domain restriction often involves a vertical asymptote. So logarithmic functions have a vertical asymptote. Typically that vertical asymptote, if you remember, is right here along the y-axis at x equals zero, unless there's a horizontal transformation. In this case there is, x minus two translates the graph two units to the right. So the vertical asymptote is to the right two units at x equals two. And from here we're just gonna plot a few more points. Now, Remember, the vertical asymptote is a domain restriction. So the graph of this logarithmic function is going to be to the right of the vertical asymptote. So you can only choose values bigger than 2. I'm going to choose x equals 3. Reason is, if you plug in a 3 for x, 3 subtract 2 is 1. 1 is always nice to have as an input inside of a logarithm, because if you recall, one of the properties we discussed log any base. So anytime there's a one as an input in a logarithm, the output is always zero. So three comma zero. Now since this is a log base three, it would be nice if whatever's inside of this logarithm comes up to be a power of three, like three or nine or 27. So if I plug x equals five, I know five seems like a random number, but it's not a random number. If you plug in a five for x, subtract two, that becomes three. And we have log base three. Log base three of three is equal to one. So five comma one. The next power of three is nine. So I'm not actually gonna plug in nine for x. I'm gonna plug in a value so that when you subtract two from it, it becomes nine. So that x value would be 11. If you plug in 11 for x, 11 subtract 2 is 9. Log base 3 of 9 is equal to 2. So 11 comma 2 right there. And there's the graph. The domain is affected because of the vertical asymptote. So the domain is going to be not including 2, 
the two to infinity, the range of any logarithmic functions graph is all real numbers. Question four and question five later on, these both are from section 4.2, expanding or condensing logarithmic expressions using one of the three additional properties from that section, which was the product property, the quotient property, or the power property. Part A of number four, you notice that x cubed multiplies y to the fifth. So this is a product. So we're going to use the product rule. Product rule says you can split this into separate logarithms separated by addition. So this is going to be log base b of x to the third plus log base b of y to the fifth. And then we apply the power rule. This log doesn't cancel this base because the bases don't match, but we can still take the exponents and move them down in front of the logarithm. So this would be 3 times the log base b of x plus 5 times the log base b of y. For part b, we have a quotient inside this logarithm, so we're going to apply the quotient rule, which says we can separate this into multiple logarithms separated by subtraction sign. So this is going to be log base b, always start with the numerator, in this case x, minus log base b of the denominator, y times z. Now we separate one more time because we have a product here. So for that logarithm, we're going to separate that into two logarithms using the product rule, log base b of x minus. Now here's a point where several students can make a mistake. We're subtracting this entire logarithm, so if we're going to expand this logarithm, we have to subtract the entire expansion using a parenthesis. So log base b of y plus log base b of z. Now you can either leave it like this, or you can get rid of the parentheses by distributing the negative. Either way, it's fine. I'm going to leave it like this since I'm out of room. So for question five, we're just going the opposite, the opposite way. We're condensing into a single logarithm. This is still from section 4.2. So notice each of these logarithms have a coefficient. These coefficients would have come from exponents, so we need to put those back up as exponents. So log base b of x to the third plus log base b of y to the fifth. Now there's a plus sign separating the two logarithms, so when these are condensed into one single logarithm, we're going to use the product rule. Product rule says that the terms inside each logarithm are going to form a product, or they're going to multiply each other. So into a single logarithm, it would be x to the third multiplied by y to the fifth. Part B, starting in a similar way, these have coefficients. So those are going to go back up as an exponent. So x plus 3 with an exponent of 1 half. This has an exponent of one third. Now I'm just going to work from left to right, so I'm going to condense these two first. And because there's a minus sign, these terms are going to form a quotient. So when these, when the first two natural logs are combined into one natural log, we're going to have a quotient. Now all that's left is to condense now these final two into a single logarithm. There's a minus sign between these two. So we're going to use the quotient rule again. So this is going to be divided by this. Now, 
think about it this way. If this fraction were multiplied by this x, then the x would go in the numerator. If this fraction is going to be divided by x, the x is going to go in the denominator. So this, when this expression forms a quotient with this expression, the x is going to go in the denominator. So we have natural log of x plus 3 of 1 half. And then this x, when we condense the logarithms, is going to go on the denominator. So it's going to be x multiplied with the other term there, x plus 2 to the 1 third. Okay, solving exponential equations we saw in several different sections. 4.1 was introduced. We um, saw a little bit more of it in 4.2. Ultimately, the, the main um, topic of solving exponential equations was in section 4.3. But they, the way that we solved it on all three times we saw it was the same. We used logarithms on both sides. First step is to try to uh, isolate the exponential term. The exponential term is the term that has the base and the exponent. Here there's nothing in front to divide by or after the term to add or subtract. So we can go right into using log base 2 on both sides. Log base 2 cancels the base 2. So this turns into log base 2 of 27 equals 3x minus 1. Now if we were to add 1, this becomes log base 2 of 27 plus 1, and then we divide by 3. So we have x equals log base 2 of 27 plus 1 divided by 3. So that's the exact form of the solution. This question is asking for the exact and approximate, so that's the exact form. The approximate solution has got to be done on a calculator. Log base 2 of 27 would need to be done on a calculator. Now, unless you have a calculator that can do a log base 2, you would have to use the change of base formula. So remember, log base 2 of 27 would turn into log of 27 divided by log of 2. Then you add 1 and divide by 3. So this is what it would look like when you type it into a calculator. Log 27 divided by log 2, hit enter, plus 1, hit enter, divide by 3, hit enter. That's going to give you your approximate form. So for the approximate form, I'm getting around 1.92. We have the exact form there and the approximate form. For part B, the exponential term, the term that has the base that needs to be canceled and the exponent is just e to the 0.1x. So we got rid of this 9 and this 2. So first step is to subtract 9. It's going to give us negative 2 e to the 0.1x equals negative 8. If we divide both sides by negative 2, we get e to the point 0.1x equals 4. Now we cancel base e using natural log. So the point 0.1x is now equal to natural log of 4, divide both sides by 0.1, we have x equals natural log of 4 divided by 0.1. That's the exact form. And then typing that into a calculator, the approximate form is 13.86. Uh, For part C, the um, 
variable that we're solving for is not only an exponent, but it's also in a fraction. I've talked about this a few times. One thing you can do so that you don't have to solve an equation with a fraction and it is multiply both sides by the denominator. So if we multiply by the denominator here and here, then the denominator would cancel on the left, leaving the numerator. So it would be 4 is equal to 2 times 10 to the 2x minus 7. Now you can divide. Now there's two things you could do. You could multiply the 2, distribute it. I'm just going to divide the 2 so that these terms don't change. So I'm going to divide the 2 over there. So the 4 becomes 2. Now you can add 7 so that 2 becomes a 9. Now we need to cancel the base 10 so that this 2x can be, um, so that we can solve for 2x. So if it's a base 10, we're just going to use a common log. Cancels a base 10. So now we have log 9 is equal to 2x. Divide both sides by 2. And we have x equals log 9 divided by 2, which is approximately like 4, 8. Question 7, solving logarithmic equations. We again saw a little bit of it in section 4.1 and in 4.3 but it was section 4.4 where we did more complicated logarithmic functions or equations to solve, such as part B or, or part C here. Uh, part A, more basic equation to solve for. The variable x is inside of a logarithm. Can't solve for the variable as long as the logarithm is there. So first step is to cancel the logarithm using a base. Base 3 cancels a log base 3. So 2x minus 1 is equal to 3 to the 4th power, which is 81. So add 1 to both sides, and we have 2x is equal to 82. Divide by 2, x is equal to 41. Now, if you recall, logarithmic functions do have domain restrictions, so you always want to make sure that your possible solution at this point doesn't fall outside the domain. So 41 times 2 is 82. 82 subtract 1 is positive. So there's a positive value inside of here with that, that, with that solution. So that is okay. Part B, we uh, discussed in class, you cannot solve a logarithmic equation if there are multiple logarithms on the same side of the equation. So the first step here is to condense these two logarithms into one. Since there's a plus sign between the two, then we're going to use the product property with the x minus 3 and the x plus 2. So I'm going to condense these two logarithms into one single log, and then the x minus 3 multiplies the x plus 2. Now that there's a single logarithm on the left side and a single logarithm on the right side, we can get rid of each logarithm by using the base, in this case base 10. So then we have on the left x minus 3 times x plus 2, and on the right we have 4x. If you distribute and multiply the two parentheses together on the left, you're going to get x squared minus x minus 6 equals 4x. So what we have now is an equation that involves x squared as the highest exponent. So this is a quadratic equation. Most of the time when you solve a quadratic equation, you want one side to equal 0. So I'm going to move the 4x, combine it. So we have x squared minus 5x minus 6 is equal to 0, which 
factors into x minus 6 and x plus 1, which means x Right now, the possible solutions are x equals positive 6 and x equals negative 1. I say possible because remember, we want to check these inside each logarithmic uh, expression from the original function. So if x is equal to 6, 6 minus 3 is positive, 6 plus 2 is positive, and 4 times 6 is positive. So 6 is okay. Negative 1 minus 3 is negative 4. So negative 1 turns this into a negative expression also turns this into a negative expression. So negative one is an extraneous solution. It needs to be crossed out. The only valid answer there is x equals six. Part C, we need to condense these into a single logarithm. Because there's a minus sign between the two, we're gonna use the quotient rule. So this is log base 10, and then the numerator, the two x minus five is in the numerator and then the x minus 3 is in the denominator. Now, the variables we're solving for x is inside of a logarithm, so we've got to cancel the log using, in this case, a base 10. So we have 2x minus 5 over x minus 3 is equal to 10. So similar to a problem that we just saw involving a fraction we don't want to solve, or we would probably want to avoid trying to solve an equation that has a fraction like this, so we can multiply both sides of the equation by this denominator x minus 3. So if we multiply by x minus 3 right here, then those just cancel, and we multiply by x minus 3 on the right side as well. So on the left side, we just have the numerator 2x minus 5. On the right side, we distribute the 10 to get 10x minus 30. If we combine terms, get the variables on one side, just like your typical junior high equation now here, if I subtract the 10x and add the 5, we have negative 8x equals negative 25 or x equals 25 divided by 8. And that's roughly 3. 25 divided by 8 is just a little over 3. So let's, let's just imagine this is right about 3. 2 times 3 is 6. 6 minus 5 is 1. So this is okay. It's still positive. Something a little bigger than 3, like 3.1, 3.1, subtract 3. It's still positive. So this turns out to be in the domain, so it's a valid solution. Eight, nine, and 10 would have been questions from section 4.5, applications of exponential functions. So for number eight, We have a radioactive substance that has a half-life of 1,600 years. So if you recall from the lesson 4.5 and the homework, these types of situations where we have exponential decay or exponential growth like with bacteria, they're all modeled using the same function. The amount at any time t is equal to the initial amount times the base e the exponent is k times t. And remember, k is the relative growth or decay rate. So we have a half-life of 1,600 years. How long will it take? 5 grams. So 5 is our initial value. The time, we're going we're gonna to let the time equal the half-life. So if we let t equal 1,600 years, then the amount after the 1600 years is going to be half because it's a half-life so this will be 2.5 grams so then we need to solve for k because we can't answer this question how long will it take 5 grams to reduce to 2 grams without finding the relative decay rate we can estimate 
that is going to be a little longer than the full half-life. If 1600 years, um, if this is allowed to sit there for 1600 years, then five grams will reduce to two and a half grams. So it's going to just be a little bit longer to go to two grams. So we know the answer is going to be a little bit longer than 1600 years. We just need to know that relative decay rate. So we're going to plug this value 2.5 into the future amount 8t. We're going to plug 5 into the starting amount and time is 1600 years. This is going to help us solve for k. So divide both sides by 5 and we get a ratio of 1 half on the left side. Now we can use a natural log on both sides. So natural log of 1 half. If we do natural log on the right side, the natural log cancels base E, so we're just left with K times 1600. Now we can divide both sides by 1600. So the, rel the, the relative decay rate is natural log of 1 half divided by 1600. And remember, if it's a relative decay rate, this should be a negative number. So I'm getting negative point zero 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 four three three. For these particular application problems, it is best if you can be as accurate as possible with these decay or growth rates. So use as many decimals as, as you can. So now that we have the relative growth rate, we can actually answer the question, how long will it take? So the question is, how long will it take? So we've got to decide which variable that's asking us to solve for. How long will it take five grams? Well, we know that's our starting amount to reduce to two grams. So two is a future amount. So that two is going to go here for the future amount. We know the relative growth rate. So the question is, how long will it take is asking us a measurement of time. So we need to solve for T. So um, when we're running out of room here, I'm going to do this over here. The future amount now is going to be 2 is equal to the starting amount 5. Base E, we know that the relative decay rate is that, but we don't know how long it's going to take. So T is the variable. So this is just an exponential equation now to solve. We've got to divide by 5 and then use a natural log. So to divide both sides by 5, we have 2 fifths equals E. And then we have our exponent here. Now we cancel the base E using natural log. So if we use natural log here, we get natural log of 2 fifths. So if we use natural log here, the E is going to cancel the base E. So we have this expression multiplying T. And if this is multiplying T, then all we got to do is divide by it to get the value of T, which is natural log of 2 fifths divided by our relative decay rate. And then we approximate here. And again, we estimated that this would be a little more than 1,600 years. So see how close we got. So I'm getting 2,115 years, roughly. 2,115 years. Okay, so for number nine, this is exponential growth. So we're going to use the same model. We have an initial count of 3,000 cells after two hours. So we know the time is two. After two hours, the count is 4,000. So the future amount here is 4,000. How many bacteria cells will there be in 12 hours? Well, we still don't know the relative growth rate. So we're gonna use that future amount of 4,000 and then the initial amount of 3,000 after two hours. Okay, so we divide both sides by 3,000. 4,000 divided by 3,000 is 4 thirds. Now we use a natural log here and a natural log here. The natural log of E is gonna cancel the base E, so this is natural log 4 thirds equals K times 2, so we divide by 2 to get the relative growth rate of natural log of 4 thirds divided by 2. 
which is about 0.14384. So the actual question is how many will there be? So that's asking us for a future amount. So if we start with 3,000, how many bacteria cells will there be in 12 hours? So we're solving for A of T. We just need to figure out the future amount. It's pretty easy. We just got to plug in the initial amount, the relative growth rate, multiply it by 12 there. So the future amount after 12 hours is equal to our starting amount times E. And then we raise e to this power here, multiply that by 12. So this is just a calculator problem. There's really not an equation to solve. It's just um, plugging this into a calculator. So I'm getting 16,855.9. So I'm going to round that up to roughly 16,856 bacteria cells. Typically with something like a bacteria cell, you don't use a decimal. You just give whole cell numbers. So 16,856 is the approximate number of bacteria cells after 12 hours. Okay, question 10. How long will it take for the population to reach... Um, 10,000, there should be a P right there. That's a typo. The population at any given time, the population at any given time is equal to 10,000 divided by this. So our time is in years. So how long will it take? How long will it take is um, asking us to find the value of T, time, for the population to reach 5,000. So this 5,000 is going to go in here for the population. And then we just need to solve for T. So we have 5,000 in there for the future population. So now we just need to solve for T. Not only is it an exponent, so we're going to have to eventually cancel the base E, but it's, again, part of a fraction here. So we're just going to multiply both sides of this equation by the denominator. And it's just going to cancel there. So we have no more fraction. I'm going to divide by 5,000 rather than distribute it. I'm going to subtract 1. Then divide by 19 so that we can get the base E by itself. So we have E now with just a single expression, no more coefficients, nothing behind it, nothing in front of it. So we can get rid of that base E now using a natural log. Because the, x, the variable we're solving for is still an exponent. So we got to cancel this base. So this is now natural log on both sides. Natural log cancels base E. So it's negative 1.56 T. And just divide both sides by negative 1.56. So you get the approximate answer in years for time. So for this one, we're getting roughly 1.89 years.